Welcome back and thank you so much. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, this will be the fun. I mean, all of it's been fun. Gosh, it sounds rude, right? Now we'll have some fun. Um, what we're going to do is sort of take the ideas that uh, everybody was talking about and, and sharing today and then throwing it out to the crowd to, to see what are, uh, we have a series of questions, but we want to take questions from you guys too. Uh, what are some great next steps that we can uh, be advancing to take what we've learned from this AML and carry it forward, not only for the benefit of Arizona and New Mexico, kind of the region that we're talking about, but how do we strengthen all aspects of it across the West, if you will, from, from uh, 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 the progress of each of these summits. Um, before we get rolling, I just wanted to uh, for those of you that are going to be on the tour tomorrow, uh, we're to meet in the, Jeremy, where are you? Why don't you come up and give instructions? Jeremy, <laughs> God love him, has been uh, one of the uh, organizers of this summit, and he's also uh, one of the key organizers of the tour tomorrow, as well as Natalie, thanks to you and a nod, because you helped us find some, um, some um, sites to go visit. All right. Yep. Go ahead and tell us where we need to meet. All right. Um, so first off, for everybody that responded to the email with your lunches, thank you so much. If you didn't respond, which I think is one person, that's a bummer because everything's ordered. <laughs> uh, we'll be meeting here in the parking lot between 7 and 7.30. We'll leave here at 7.30 a.m. pretty much on the nose. And then Natalie and U.S. Forest Service, I think you guys were meeting at the gas station there. I think somebody else has arranged to meet at the gas station and then jump in one of our vehicles. We're limited to just the five vehicles that we have. So we really don't have room for extras, except we do have one extra spot because Jason is, is out. So if you want it in, Wayne, let me know. You got to bring a sandwich, though. Sarah. Um, Sarah. Yes, yeah, so we'll leave. Sarah, Sarah's not going either. So, either. so maybe we have to. Sarah was her spot was already taken by oh, somebody yes. else. Right. Oh. <laughs> oh, thanks okay, a lot, so we Wayne. Have, we have another spot open. And so, well, then we have room. Never mind, there's no more space. Sorry. <laughs> so we'll leave here at 7.30 in the morning, and then I think we get back here um, around 5, 5.30 p.m. You guys can all leave your cars here in the parking lot, and I'll be safe and that sort of stuff. Uh, sturdy shoes. We don't really have PPE requirements, as I said in the email, so we don't need hard hats or anything like that, but wear some sturdy shoes or, or hiking boots. Uh, sunscreen, obviously, and then we'll have a bunch of waters in the truck for you guys as well, but, you know, bring some hydration. I guess while I'm here, is there any questions about the tour or, or anything like that? All right. And then again, thank you so much, Natalie and uh, Mark with the Forest Service. Super stoked to go see these sites and really appreciate the time and effort. Okay, well, all of you have the agenda. You see there's a list of questions there. You know, obviously this was developed prior to the discussions we've had to this point today. So if there are things on here that we think we're missing or <clears throat> if you feel that there's something really burning that you wanna put onto this list, feel free to do that. Um, we will have the microphone running around again, but Ann and I decided we'd let you guys all take a shot at us. So we're sitting up here right now. <clears throat> Bless you all for the, the ones who uh, sat in the hot seat. Now we figure we might as well be in the hot seat too with you. And these questions are meant to drive discussions, but by no means to dictate discussions. So if there's another way that the group wants to go, then we will take it in that direction. Um, go ahead. Why don't you lead off with what you want to start with? I, I actually would like to start with the discussion on question number two. It's come up a couple times today. You know, we talked about getting a list because I, I think this first question will lead, will ultimately be part of the answer to the second question. So I'd like to start there. Um, so, you know, we talked about, you know, creating a list of potential sites that could be that 15. Um, and as much as I'd like to say we should use 
the last map that Jeff showed, <clears throat> because Nevada would get more than anybody else. Um, I, you know, I think more importantly, what we heard from the first panel today is that we need 15 wins. And the biggest wins we can get are what we need. So I, I think that whatever we come up with as, and that's where I'm saying the next, the first question, what does a success look like? Um, I think that ought to drive what, how we go through the process of selecting the sites. Now, that, as we just talked in the last session, that's not necessarily meaning we meet some water quality standard. I liked the idea that Ann mentioned, you know, it, we need to think about it in the context of value beyond simply numerical standards or, or what an engineer or geologist might think and try and get big wins. Um, if we can get as many of those as we can out of the 15, we ought to do it. And I know that states and groups and everybody wants to have some of them theirs and we get that. But I think if we are honest about it and we try and find 15 big wins, I suspect everybody will get a, a slice of the pie. We may not, they, there may be more in one location than another, but I just think right now, if we're thinking long-term, we need to think as many big wins as we can get. So that's sort of my comment on the second slide, but, or the second question, but based on that, what does a big win look like? Jason. Sorry. Judy, you're gonna get your steps in. What does a big win look like? So I'm gonna I'm gonna divert this question back to your original statement and just um, kind of suggest that as we look at these projects, maybe it's not just focused on um, location or project type, uh, but more on what we're trying to achieve. So, for example, we have the opportunity to reprocess through this pilot. Um, you know, so identifying a couple that meet that target and try to demonstrate uh, success, not only regionally, but uh, with the, the opportunities that the, that the legislation provides. Sarah, and then uh, Tawny, or whoever you reach first. I think uh, what was learned from the last panel, the third panel, is I think we need to go to our stakeholders and we need to engage early. Um, one of the projects I know of were, were tribal consultation and, and of course trust for the project was, was not as good as Resolution Copper, was a project that I was a project manager for the Forest Service, which was Rosemont Copper Project. It was very different. So I think that um, when developing this list, maybe we next step would be maybe going to stakeholders and, and doing tribal collaboration, tribal, you know, on, on the list as well. And maybe look, looking, at, looking at like, because of the big um, shift in the, in the last 10 years, I would say in the mining industry about environmental justice. So social environmental engagement, mm -hmm. seeing where the greatest need is for those local rural kind of lower income communities. Thank you. Bonnie. So Jeff, I just wanted to clarify on the second question on creating lists. So we've got a couple, as we said, puzzle pieces. Are we talking about a list of 15 pilot projects? Are we talking about a list of projects that could hopefully receive funding from the infrastructure bill, which would have, I would assume, less conditions than our good SAM legislation so that it opens it up to different kinds of process, like projects. Oh, interesting on reprocessing, yes, there's a provision in the Good Sam bill that addresses reprocessing, but I, it is limited to federal lands. And also, would the federal government consider reprocessing to be low risk? Doubtful. But, <clears throat> would they consider it what? To be low risk. Reprocessing yeah, low risk, to be yeah. considered low risk. Like, we had a project on Low risk. For reprocessing? Yeah. Absolutely. What would, have, what would have made it low risk? So the reason why it would be low risk is, is that these were, were tailings piles that were not that far away from national forest systems, roads. I mean, we're, we're talking right next to the road. And 
could be easily um, accessed by a small front end loader Bobcat. Uh, nothing was growing on these piles because it's sulfide. Nothing's really going to grow on that. Um, and what they were going to do is they're going to transport them off forest to a private facility in a town next to it where they were going to crush it and then ship it somewhere else. And so Forest Service, at least our specialists were like, this is pretty low risk. If anything, it's actually a benefit to the forest for them to take this stuff off forest and get rid of it. I mean, that's a flat out removal. So to, to private land. Can I, can I answer your question, Tani? I think that's awesome that the Forest Service thought of one reprocessing project as being low risk. So thanks for that information. Um, I hadn't heard about that before. Um, good, Sam, you also need a partner. So who, when you think of those, it goes back to the stakeholder outreach, right? If you want 15 pilot projects, you need an applicant who's going to go through that. Is it Trout Unlimited? Is it a mining company? Is it another nonprofit organization? So is it the tribe? Is it yeah. the tribe? Yeah. So offered. you need yeah. to think strategically about who would want to do the work. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you asked a couple of questions in there, Tani. But my... You know, I think that your first question about are we trying to come up with a list of, you know, a long list that we could use for either one of those, you know, are we doing it for the 15? Are we doing it for a larger um, list? I think the answer is yes. I, I think the first start is, and somebody mentioned this, if we could even get started with a list of, I don't know, 10 or 20 priority sites from 10, 10 from 20, each site. 20 gets hideous. But at it's least we end up with a list and then, but I'm su suggesting that once we get to that list, we select the 15 for the good Sam bill, assuming it goes forward very carefully so that we get big wins that we can say, this is what can be done. That, that was my point. Not that we limit the list to 15 total, but when we get down to that selection process, we try and hit the ones that get the biggest wins. Hey, Leroy, fair warning. I'm going to put you on the spot again. Uh, could you run it over to the back corner for Leroy? Oh, oh for you? Uh, this is Ryan from oh, IMCC. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to build on what, what Tani was saying and, and also respond to the question of just, you know, what would count as a win in terms of the, the Good Samaritan projects? And, uh, you know, I think if the idea is with this pilot bill to demonstrate these kinds of projects work, I mean, clearly we want projects that have a big environmental impact, but we also want to show that different types of Good Samaritan projects work, I think. And so in addition to having um, some successful projects with NGOs like Trout Unlimited, with mining companies, uh, with tribes potentially, I just wanted to add that I think it would be great to see at least one, if not multiple projects where the state themselves was the Good Samaritan applicant, because mm -hmm. as, as many of you probably know, the state themselves has just the same liability problems as NGOs and mining companies in trying to treat water. Um, so it'd be nice to demonstrate that uh, it can work that way as well. Uh, Natalie, you, you game to fall on that grenade? Yeah. Yeah. And Robert. Probably That's a, too. Yeah. And Robert too. You guys um, ready to fall on that grenade? Could you guys do, um, could you be the applicant? Yeah, definitely. There would definitely be opportunities for the state agencies to do this, um, and be the actual, or the good Samaritan in it. Um, but one of the things that I look at this in the biggest opposition that we've always seen for the Good Samaritan bills in the past is this is a bypass for mining companies to remine without having a permit, right? And so I think one, uh, one option or one idea of a success would be a mining company remediating tailings that may or may not be near a water source, because remember, they want damp, not wet. That's low risk that I've heard a lot of times, damp, Correct, not yeah. wet, um, to have it to where they actually reprocess and use that funds to help fund additional Good Samaritan projects, right? Taking the money that was earned mm -hmm. off that reprocessing. And there's spots in Nevada that, in my opinion, could be low risk. Think of Rochester Canyon, right? You got one of the largest heat leeches in the U.S. right up the hill, and there is tailings going miles down from the 18, er, early 1900s, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's opportunities for that type of success in multiple states. Um, I, I want to put Leroy on the spot and then you get to run all the way to the front of the room for Virginia. 
Leroy, Abby, anybody at your table? Sorry, I'm just uh, seeing Leroy. How do you, how would you propose the tribe being an applicant in this situation? And more importantly, a participant in defining what is, um, is, is uh, high, high value AML um, reclamation or improvements? What we, you know, I wanna make sure that we fold in the tribal perspective on, on what you deem, y'all deem as, as value, valuable projects to get restored. I think um, for me personally, I, I, those are questions that just need to be asked of the tribes um, okay. themselves. It's, it, you know, I can give you an answer what I deem it, but what they say is totally different. And I think, like I said, each tribe knows their own um, tribal lands and what they think would be the most important cleanup if we do have one. So that, those are perfect. This, but Avi has some. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, I think that's great what Leroy said. And I guess a question for you and kind of going back to what Jacob was saying earlier, you know, being from some of the Apache communities in the mountains, you know, he, he has personal knowledge of some of these places. You know, can a tribe, since they're a sovereign nation, can they be one of the applicants, you know, to get some of this work done? Or does it have to just be each state or how, how does it work exactly? How, so who, who did As you ask currently that? Written. Yeah, anybody. Okay. No restrictions, Perfect. just as long as you're not a former owner operator. So a, yeah. So a, there's another acronym. I meant to ask Leo, Leroy. Sorry. Um, what was Tipo? Right. Tribal Tipo? Historic Preservation Officer. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. As in like, Shippo Tipo. Okay. okay got, got it. Got it. Yeah, and I think, you know, so that's just a like potential we were, responsible party a PRP. So as long as nobody triggers that, then then it's free range, right? Yeah. Tony? Yeah, I mean, if you get it, like, you need all the application requirements, Right. And if I, if I, I think I heard the tribal monitoring uh, folks with the tribes as part of the uh, uh, sort of the engagement team on, on an AML front, the, the, the uh, team working on it, it might open doors to more or different money. Isn't that, uh, I think that's what I thought I heard a little earlier or did I, did I miss that? It, it may, I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. if it would open up other funds, but I think, you know, going back to the original question is that you know, I think there should be some type of effort, you know, there's certain probably small tribal communities that don't have any mines on them. And I think that the LART, you know, the communities that have known mines on them, you should, they should be reached out to and, no, that's and, and asked, you know, yep. hey, what's your concern here? So, somebody mentioned, well, Tony, funding, they have to have financing, there has to be money behind it. So where's the money going to come from? Um, you know, one of the sources of money we've talked about the infrastructure bills, hard rock program with 50% of those funds being granted to states and tribes, um, you know, right there's a primary source of funding that could be paired with a good Samaritan program. So you've got the policy tool, you've got the funding, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a good match for both states and tribes to take advantage of good SAM and this source of funding. So you could use the infrastructure funding. Correct. For, for good Sam, the way the two bills are written. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> I, I know as I, I, I made a comment on this on the second um, summit in, in Colorado, you know, I, no, no, the second one, Colorado. Colorado was first. And second. She's for, she, you know, gray hair. What can I say? Of course, I don't have any hair, but that's how I dealt with the problem. Um, the, uh, you know, the mining industry has been more than willing to jump into this. I remember when there were a spate of bankruptcies in the late 90s, early 2000s, sitting in a Nevada Mining Association Environmental Committee meeting. And when we, this one company went bankrupt, and I think they had like 12 sites, uh, several of them were in, posed an imminent risk to the environment if they walked away. I mean, we're talking 
hours upset kind of numbers. Um, these would have been, they were, they were not good. It was a bad situation. And everybody around the table said, we can do that. We know how to close these sites. We know how to keep them from becoming a problem. We have the people, we have the experience, we have the money and uh, we have the equipment. Let's do this. The problem was there was a lawyer at the table, apologies, um, Tawny. And, and the problem with the mining companies is they also had the lawyers and they just said, not a chance, not a chance, which is part of what's been driving the push um, for the AML bill. They're more than willing to take, take, make the effort, put the money on the table to clean up a lot of these sites. There just hasn't been relief from some of the liabilities associated with it. So if we can get that working, I'm sure that we can reach out to the mining industry. I bet they will pony up a fair amount of money and not just money, but human resources and, and knowledge resources to help work on these things. I think they'd be all over it, be my take. Tony, I mean, you're, would, Mark, you're Sid, right. you guys, I mean, there's so mining association people right there. I, the industry wants to do this. They've been wanting to do it for decades. Now, if we can make this work, we'll finally get, things will start happening quickly. Well, and I think um, to a point of fact with TU in the room, I think um, we, there, was my, there were companies that provided funding and they provided it through you all. And maybe there wasn't equipment and people provided, but at least the funds. And then you, you all were able to deploy um, the AML efforts in the field and get some work done that way, correct? So. I think one of the first things, that, uh, one of the things that we talked about in the first summit was that we we need a a place to house the money, and in a nonprofit is a great way to do it because more and more companies, agencies, and other other entities, you know, even USDA funds, you know, typically or arguably could be put in there, um, can be uh, hosted or or invested, deposited in a in an NGO, a nonprofit, and then distributed a little easier. Correct. That's one of the mechanisms. That would be, and you know, this bill also includes. Oh, sorry, Virginia. Um, the bill also includes a um, a good SAM fund. Um, that mm -hmm. Congress could appropriate monies into, that um, excess funds off of reprocessing would have to go into, mm -hmm. uh, and that individuals, uh, you know, mining companies uh, could make donations into that fund that would be used for good stamp purposes. So that's the other uh, possibility when we pass this bill. Correct. Sorry, Virginia. I think we're seeing enough movement towards reprocessing mill tailings that some of these technologies will be coming available quickly. And, uh, and certainly if it goes hand in hand where we actually can get some of these tailings perhaps going under the good SAM. I mean, I know that there's several tailings in New Mexico that some are on federal land, some are on private land. Yes, they've been covered, but if they're on federal land, people are putting mining claims on them and they're looking seriously at going in and trying to reprocess this. And I think some of these do have the potential for having not only some of the critical minerals, but some of these others. And so I really think that on this list, we ought to try to find some of these tailings. And, you know, in New Mexico, we don't have water when you're south of uh, I-40. I mean, it, it's just not there. <laughs> and so they, they end up being low risk. The, the question, though, that does come is that are they of significant size to really be looked at? And this may be the program to really go after and look at them, whether they are big enough or not, but to actually start, you know, taking a look at some of these tailings. And I think some of these should be on there. I do know there are some companies in New Mexico looking for trying to reprocess tailings. I guess trying to extract 10 out of each state from the room would be inappropriate at this point, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I think what maybe an outcome would be, we would reach out to the tribes, we'd reach out to the state agencies and because the state agencies are gonna have a, a list of priority one sites they'd like to deal with the damp to dry, not the wet. That's been a term that we coined from the beginning as well. 
um, because it damp or dry doesn't trigger uh, the Clean Water Act, uh, or at least we can dodge it a bit and then get more work done. Um, that could be a mechanism where uh, maybe the, you know, there, anyway, there's a, a, a methodology of being able to create at least a beginning list and then have it pared down to 10 that would uh, have a lot of stakeholders that would weigh in on the, the particular benefits of them. I, I think I would also engage the state mining associations. Yep. Yeah. Many of them have a really good idea regional. among other things. Yeah. What? Regional too. And the regional ones like the AEMA, um, National Mining Association. Um, we could even, you know, but if, if we got all those people working together, among other things, most, most of the, or a lot of the mines have AML sites nearby, you know, if not next door, um, they may even have carve outs in the middle of their holdings. Um, and they'd be much more willing to jump into taking on those. It'd be a lot easier for them to, to support that kind of work, I would think. I mean, the Rochester Canyon one you mentioned, Robert, is a perfect example of that. Yes, ma'am. You can't see the name. Oh, it's jo Jody. Yeah. I'm Jody Banta from the University of Arizona. It just seems like this is a really good outreach and education opportunity. You know, you're reaching out to stakeholders, you're telling them this is out there, educating them about the bill, the opportunity, how does this work, maybe some success stories or just a really great way to communicate with everyone about what this might be when you're soliciting their input about what these, you know, which sites to put on this list. So it's just, it's an opportunity. Is it also an opportunity to get in front of politicians we need to get support for the house? I'm just thinking, right? I'm looking at the people who either in Washington or there on a regular basis and Corey, right? And that's one of the things that we've often heard is you know, one of the things that we've heard from a number of offices is, okay, where, you know, what are the sites that, that this could apply to? Um, and so I think being able to bring it from like this somewhat abstract policy down to this is the site that we're going to make better um, would help to um, offer some comfort to some politicians and advocacy groups that are suspicious of Good Sam. So a couple, couple of poster children to put in front of them is what you're saying, right? Yep, absolutely. Is that, is that what you meant, Jody? That kind of thing? You have a, we have a variety of stakeholders to engage on this subject. Yeah. Everyone from like the mining associations to local community organizations, to the tribes, to you name it. There's a number of people that are interested in this and may have a, a voice to share. So each one of them needs to hear something. Uh, they need a little bit different information but politicians being one of the audiences that you have to reach out to, right? So, so it's just a um, good way to get the message out. Here's a thought for you guys. Do, is most of the opposition coming from the coasts? And if so, do we need to look for support, you know, opportunities there? It doesn't, oh, they're, they're all shaking their heads. No, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not left coast, right coast against the rest. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Good try. Just a thought. Oh, okay. Fair enough. What did he say? He said it's not. He said it's not congressional opposition. That was Mark Compton from AEMA. Jeff. I hate to volunteer to do extra work, but uh, I'm going to have. To, I'm. I hate to volunteer to do extra work, but I'm going to have to do this anyhow. Um, one of the things that we do as part of the U.S. Men team is we publish these databases on critical minerals in the United States. Um, this list was recently redone, and mm -hmm. there are now 50 of them, yep. in part because they split the rare earth elements into individual elements, mm -hmm. and in, they split the platinum group elements into individual elements. Um, is a comment if there's anybody in the room that can find a platinum only mine that has no palladium please let me know <laughs> um because i i definitely want to work with that person <laughs> yeah. yeah but we we have published a number of those critical mineral databases and as part of the earth mri um 
mine waste initiative, I promised them that we would deliver the list of the 10 largest past producers of copper, lead, zinc, silver, gold in the United States, plus the list of the top 10 past producers of the 25 of the 50 critical minerals that we've completed our lists on. Oh, wow. All of that is in the public domain. Some of those, there's only one. Butte, for example, is the only deposit in the United States that has past production records of tellurium. Even though we know tellurium has been produced at many other mines, that information is not in the public domain, right? Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of deep duplication. Mm -hmm. Rio Tinto, the Bingham mine, for example, is going to appear on more than one of this list. But because I have to do this anyhow, if you all want that, I can send that up to whoever needs that information. And that's the elephants in the room. So if you want to capture that, I can, I can give you that. Perfect. Does that include operations that, well, I guess Butte's an example that no longer operator is it ones that, it, is it's, it, it's, it's all over the show. Some are still active. Red Dog is the biggest zinc producer in, in, in the US and they're still active, right? Okay. And Butte is still active. Right, because there's the, the little pit that's producing the molybdenum. So it depends on how you look at Berkeley Pit, of course. Yes. Is, yeah, yeah. Depends on which part of Butte you're talking about. And the Eagle Mine, nickel. Yeah, Eagle yeah. Mine is active, right? Yeah. Right, right, right. That's right. Okay. And probably one of the better remediation examples in the United States, but I didn't say that. Uh, I just got done auditing their closure plan. So yeah, I would agree with you, Jeff. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a nice project. Um, so we've done one, we've done two, um, add to the growing list of known partnerships and collaboratives, uh, working on AML. So, uh, we've been highlighting TU's work because they've been, um, uh, very engaged in this process and, and going out and getting the work done and hoping to dodge the liability bullet. And they have, and they've done very successful partnership building. So I also, I think had lunch with, I uh, can't quite see him uh, unless he's gone. Um, somebody from backcountry. Um, well, there you are. Hi, hiding. Uh, is this, um, I, not to put you on the spot, but I do it for everyone in the room. Um, is this something that backcountry wants to be engaged in going forward or are you still sort of fact finding? No, this is something that BHA is definitely interested in, in assisting with and being involved in. And I often defer to Corey over there who spoke earlier, but you know, this is something that we wanna be a partner on as much as possible. And then, of course, uh, I'm not sure if Carrie's still on the phone, but there's the Sierra Fund, uh, which they, they're they sort of a larger, not, not so much national organization as they are very regional and specifically focused, I think, in California, although they've stepped out and given you guys a hand on a couple of uh, projects. Um, do you guys have any other ideas, Virginia? Maybe we need another runner, huh? Are you saying I'm not fast? No, you're fine. Okay. Yeah, as I sit up here on the dais, right? I know there are some AML, state AML that's funded by the coal severance tax funds in the room, but I think we need to reach out, like to my state. Um, I did notice that Lloyd was on this call because I had sent them the information to it, but I think we do need to specifically reach out to a lot of these AML states that aren't here because the reason they're not here is that they're overwhelmed they're busy but they also don't have funds to get involved with these kinds of organizations and and all and so i think we need to reach out to them specifically and 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 get their involvement because they are on boots on the ground they're they're helping with the they're doing the inventories they're definitely out there not only doing the coal but they're doing a lot of the hard rock and so they have their success stories and every now and then they do go out and and take a look and monitor some of the sites that they've done. And sometimes they have to go back. Are they conservation nonprofit or? Well, they, no, these are the state the AML. State, yeah. yeah, the state yeah, AML. They, they, they vary, like mine are part of the minerals and natural resources up in Santa Fe. So they're, cause we're non-regulatory, but I know New Mexico and I don't know how many of the other states are here, 
but any of those that have co-production, they all have AML programs and been getting money all these years. And we've talked about the national or the, the, the coal, the group that the overseeing group, I forget the name of it. I, I should, shouldn't because it's because they give my students uh, scholarships, but the, uh, the, the larger group that puts all those together. Okay, perfect. Think big, how about Tesla? They just, like they, were, they were the first, you know, basically mineral to supplier investor in Talon Metals, Minnesota. So right. that's kind of something that's- Just recently, right? To yeah, secure nickel production, was yeah, it? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah. just, it's a huge, huge step. So they're cutting so, out, they're cutting out the middleman. Well, they're- but They're, they're doing an off-take agree agreement, right? Yeah, think, but it, yeah. it's just yep. out of the box. But, yeah, I like it. But then you have to add in companies like Panasonic, who actually make the battery cells that go into the battery packs that are made at Tesla that go into the Tesla cars. So, I mean, Panasonic, I mean, I think it's a great idea. Think big. But Tesla is actually sort of the end user at that point, um, as opposed to the people who are actually using the product and manufacturing from it. It's the battery makers like Panasonic. Did you, did you know that? Because at the Gigafactory right outside Reno, it's it's split down the middle between Panasonic and Tesla. Panasonic makes the battery cells, and then they ship them, or they take them through the wall and give them to Tesla, and they put and them they in hand their them battery. out the window and give it to them. Apparently, yeah. they are not allowed to. Very few people are allowed to cross through that wall, but somehow or other, they get the batteries from one side to the other. Yeah, in a way that it's brilliant. I I like the way you're thinking because Tesla's securing that uh, that um production so wherever it lands in its home whether it's you know directly to them or to panasonic or others that are building the batteries it's securing it kind of anchoring it here at home too yeah jody so i, I do think it's worth talking or trying talking to the nature conservancy as a potential partner they have a history of partnering with mining companies, at least in Arizona, and then their strategic plan includes, they're driven, it's driven by systems thinking, and it's, it's hard to imagine you know, how these things aren't tied together. Several people mentioned forest health. Forest health is key for them. Um, they're in, the, in Arizona, the San Pedro River is a priority for them. Um, and then the Rio Grande Waterfront in New Mexico, maybe there's a way to tie that in. Actually, Nature Conservancy had a representative at our last one in Reno, which, but yeah, that was one individual from Las Vegas. But, but, and I think their their goal was, and I'm not sure if TU worked with them at all, but um, was to uh, co-use or or find abandoned sites to for renewable energy deployment and energy generation. And I I know Rob, I know she's been working with you quite a bit. So yeah, which is. Uh, an interesting twist because you're taking an abandoned site and turning it into an industrial site, which is kind of cool. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for that um, reminder, Jody. National Forest Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're really interested in doing partnerships like between um, stakeholders, forest service, and private industry because I've had conversations with them that unfortunately had to end because. Rosemont Copper Project's plan of operations got rescinded by the federal courts. Oh. And now we're waiting for a Ninth Circuit decision still. Oh. Okay. Well, you know, actually, and the, the Jana's, you know, focus on redeveloping for renewable energy. She was looking for larger sites where you could do wind or solar or something like that. But mm -hmm. are there energy companies that we should be talking to? Mm -hmm. Or people, I don't know, companies who sell solar panels. I, yeah, I don't know. Oh, there you go. That's a good point. Because you know, wind, solar, they all make and precious too, but 8% of all solar production. 50%? 8%. 8% does, yeah. Silver, silver. I mean, like, right. Who would, who would have thought? Yeah, I thought it was all fiberglass. <laughs> no. 
Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, one thought would be to continue making this forum be sort of like a traveling forum and inviting local NGOs from different states wherever we go. Obviously, a lot of representation here from uh, Arizona today, but um, yeah, an idea to do it. <clears throat> In Idaho, I will yeah. put in a plug for Idaho for sure. Yeah. Um, continue moving this around and getting people in the room. And that, thank you for that. That has been the objective of the uh, AML committee. The, the summit committee is to, we didn't want to just anchor it in our starting place of Colorado, but we wanted to march around so that we engaged with more state, federal agencies, with, with local communities, with mining companies, and with different uh, uh, nonprofits working in the region. And that's how we got tapped into when we moved into Reno, did it in Reno, we got the Sierra Fund came over. And, and Diane, if you're still in the ether, uh, a great shout out to Diane Anderson, who's a co-conspirator on this uh, and planner on this AML uh, committee. She, her objective has always been from the beginning, let's get more of the the uh, conservation groups involved because they're going to come with a different perspective and a different partnering opportunity. So thanks for that. We'll, uh, we'll Jack, we'll take that back for consideration with MMSA where we go next. Uh, he's putting the plug in for Idaho. So there we go. We're off to Idaho. <laughs> I also would like to add that we maybe we may want to reach out to the national laboratories like Sandia, Los Alamos and New Mexico. And then I don't know how we can engage the Department of Energy. Um, they have a number of grants that they are giving out for not looking at the expiration and where I am, but they do are they have grants that they've been given to a lot of companies to look at how to reprocess or how to process some of these critical minerals. And so you might be able to pair one of these grants on processing with some of this. Um, uh, good SAM type of money. Um, you may be able to get the national laboratories in it because they've also been um, getting quite, I mean, they're involved in this carbon core of the 12 carbon core projects throughout the country, um, the laboratories are. And so they very well are looking at this already. And I mean, there's some really sharp folks and some sharp ideas coming out of there. Wow, that's great. Great mind map. Yeah, I'm taking notes. She's playing video games. And I'm sorry, and I'm losing. <laughs> um, the next point was to identify new organizations to invite to the coalition, but I think we've done that in that last conversation. And then the other one is suggestions for next steps to build more momentum on the, uh, the advancement of AML work. So taking it into Idaho, Montana, maybe there's an opportunity just like we married Arizona and New Mexico together for the Southwest. Maybe we kind of create, uh, maybe it's an Idaho, Montana and, and Wyoming nexus the next time, or maybe it's just Idaho. But uh, we'll put that out to the committee and, and uh, 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 figure out where we're going and, and let you all know there's no reason just because we, we might have an interest down in the Southwest that, that heading up North wouldn't have a benefit as well. And everybody, we all can, we can all convene next April up in, I don't know, Boise or something, but with concurrence from MMSA Coeur leadership. <laughs> Coeur <d 'Alene>. Yeah. <laughs> it's an act of God to get up there. Mark will host the <laughs> Right. Are there any other next steps from the audience um, and the participants that, that, that maybe we haven't mentioned or that you've just been sitting on and, and thinking about that you'd like to bring up? Yeah. with uh, Western Solutions in Denver, um, work with various state agencies uh, in terms of an outline for- Can, can you ideal... get the microphone? Oh, sorry. So in terms of an outline for what an ideal project actually looks like, I see your question of successful AML project, but how about on the front end in terms of what attributes you may be looking for in a particular site to someday down the road get funding for it? Have, have you guys developed- I mean to like create that? a- yeah, you know, kind of a wish list of what's the best, what's the best opportunity that might be attractive to, you know, individual funding, um, hmm. whether it's, you know, the hydrology or whether it's the geology or whether it's the cultural issues or, you know, a lot of the aspects that we've talked about. 
Have you guys developed anything along those lines? Well, <clears throat> in the last Colorado one, we had breakout sessions where we did come up with some lists. I don't, I don't remember how those got published. Sorry, I don't know how those, in the, in the second one we did in Colorado, we actually had breakout sessions. And that was one of the questions we asked people to come up with, you know, how would you go about this? What's the, what are the priorities? What would you be looking for, for one of these? And I think we even talked about it last time when we were looking at pilot sites um, before yeah. this good Sam bill really got rolling in 2019. Yeah, the the uh, breakout session in Colorado that he's referring to did kind of try to create uh, characterizations and 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 then we took that and attributes and what are the what are the things that we'd be looking for? And then we took that to Reno to uh, to take it a little bit further because there was some momentum for these four pilot sites that was coming out of um, EPA, and I think EPA Tony remind me if I'm wrong they were talking about just doing it. They wanted to be able to show that that would help motivate uh, legislation and not really need legislation. They wanted four sites that 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 they could advance um, in those original discussions to try to be kind of the motivator for for um, legislation. And we just couldn't we couldn't come to um, we couldn't create that list. Uh, there was reticence from state and agencies on well, how do we do that and how are we not implicated. Uh, and so that then I think drove over the next two years uh, through COVID the, this collaborative partnership that you guys did. But the, I think those four, the original four pilot program was really something that EPA was going to somewhat fund and form the partnerships and not really need legislation, right? Yeah, but that was the prior administration's leadership Correct, yeah. in EPA. And unfortunately, with Shahid not being able to join us. Right. I'm not sure what EPA's Office of Mountains, Deserts, and Plains is actually up to in this administration. So right. I don't know if those four unidentified pilot projects are still on the table for consideration or if they've rethought how they want to move. Or, animals or, or again, <clears throat> maybe because there's this traction on this other front that that um, uh, we've been able to see, maybe uh, Shad's just sitting back and saying, well, let's get this pushed through. And then there's 15 of them instead of four. Yeah, I, that would be a conversation with him. So maybe one of the action items is to have a meeting with him. And I reached out to him last week, but we just kept playing phone tag. So unfortunately, I don't have anything to add, but he is the director of that office and working on all this back in DC. Any other next steps? Get this good Sam bill passed. <laughs> That's an obvious one. <clears throat> what? <clears throat> Everybody contact your congressman. Yeah. That's my question is exactly, you know, what I, I, I belong to several organizations and when they want legislation passed, they send you like a, send this letter to your congressman, like an email template. And all you do is send your name and send it and it goes straight out. Um, I just want to figure out what can we do to make it really easy to pass the word along? to get the word out, you know, to our networks and then say, here's what you could do to, so, you know, here's what this bill's about and here's what you could do to support it. Just how can we make it as easy as possible? We could take a lead on that and put it on the MMS A site. Sorry. Oh yeah, they're really good at it. I could have sworn it was women in mining women, that did women's it. Women's mining coalition. Women's mining coalition. The women's yep. mining coalition. And I and I used to and I almost still, I don't get them anymore really. But yeah, whenever there was legislation, I would always get an email and I would fill them out. Any anything that had any anything, even if it was a writer in in some other bill, <laughs> like yeah. So Tani, is is that something that national mining could help us with to create an easy trigger? And then we can distribute it to not only this uh, working list, but MMSA's um, membership, AEMA's yeah. membership, to the universities, Jody, to your, to your question, to, and then just a broad spectrum uh, to send it out. We, uh, Jack and I talked about it after the first morning session that maybe that could be one of our outcomes of this meeting is that we, we have such a great, um, 
support and bipartisan support on this AML uh, legislation, proposed legislation. How do we drive that into the House? How do we drive it even into the Senate? It's great to have 12, but there's a, another, I can't do the math fast enough, um, number of senators we still have to get on. Um, and then we have the whole House to commit, uh, to convince as well, or at least to educate on. So maybe a follow-up would be, I could work with you and and um, Women's Mighty Coalition too. I mean, they could just be, they could be another mechanism to distribute. The idea being that when, when, especially if we can have like several letters and people can personalize them, then they, yeah, they make, um, yeah, right, so Jody first. The only thing I was gonna add is the, the organization I get these things from all the time is Environmental Defense Fund. And so they may take a position on this and it would be good to can maybe talk to them first, but um, they're very yeah. good at this. Yeah, they're very good at, yeah. yeah. Most of the NGOs are, yeah, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Many opportunities for everybody in this room to engage. Hearings, so hearings and markups. Hearings, yeah. markups. I mean, we got a long haul process ahead of us where voices will be important every step of the way. So is there an opportunity to tap into this brain trust here for for um, uh, hearing participants, expert, you know, testimonies and experts? Absolutely, there will be, because whenever there is a hearing on the Senate side, they will be reaching out to our organizations for witnesses. Um, and so, yeah, we can, we can definitely work through that. And as far as the letter writing campaigns, I know you guys have the, the tool where it's, it, it's a point and click for, for individuals. And you can go in, you can send the letter as is, you can you know, amend it to personalize a little bit, but yeah, we can definitely make that happen and get it to NMA's mailing list, AEMA's, Women's Mining Coalition, MMSA, we can get it out far and wide. So are you suggesting you have the point and click or you're talking that maybe National Mining does? Correct, okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, and Trot Unlimited has an action alert set up right now. And I think Backcountry Hunters and Anglers does as well um, that are the same, you know, form letters, you can modify them to personalize them. Um, so we can maybe put together like a toolkit that, you know, pick your action alert, um, pick them all. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, far and wide, we're trying to build a momentum around um, uh, this great bipartisan effort that we haven't really seen ever in the 20, 25 years that I've been talking about AML. Well, the state mining associations can also get word out and put links as well. Those, those are, Heck, send it to the Western Governors Association. Get them to get people to put stuff in. Reach out to their constituents. Anything else? Any other ideas? Jody, you got us going for a while on that one. You got any more? Well done. No, you're all tapped out. Okay. <laughs> all right. Anybody well, I, I from MMSA and the. Um... I, have, I have one more question. Uh oh. It was something I thought about when we were, I was going back through um, my, my lists to, on the part about lists. Um, and I, I wasn't clear, maybe Natalie or one of the tribal monitor team could answer this question. If you guys have, if you have a list of AML sites, from what I heard, I mean, tell me if I'm right or wrong, the, the state list may not include everything that's on on the tribal lands, is that correct? Did I hear that correctly? I know on our end, we're just beginning on our list. And so it's it's kind of small and it's not exhaustive by any means. So we still need to build up that list. And from the, the, the tribal monitor team, is that something that we should reach out to the, to the tribes to, to build those lists for us? Is that something I mean, I think it really varies. Obviously, you know, Navajo has a very robust, you know, program and they know where a lot of their, you know, uh, resources are there. 
Um, I think for some of the other tribes, you know, there are natural resources departments and other things like that. I think it would be good to, to reach out to them. You know, I don't understand how else we'd be able to make a list. I know BLM Arizona has done some AML um, classification. I think state lands office, maybe a little bit. So, you know, as far as I know, I know Tana Atom has done some closure out there. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of mines up on, you know, White Mountain and Jacob's always telling me about. So I don't think all of them have done an inventory. And I think, um, you know, if you go to the Arizona SHPO government to government webpage, you'll see all the contacts for all 22 tribes in Arizona. And I think a, a letter should be sent to them, you know, asking them if they have an in, in, internal inventory. Maybe they've started one. Okay. All right. Thanks. That answered my question. Anything else? For for the Arizona State Mine Inspector's Office, we don't even have jurisdiction on sovereign lands. So so you, so you wouldn't necessarily so even I, know. I don't have any inventory at all on sovereign lands. We have probably done a few, but for the most case, uh, sovereign lands take care of their own lands. So. Not that we're not willing to work with them. We just only have a staff of two. So it's not a lot of help we can do. Yeah, I, I just wouldn't want to leave a bunch of sites out because we're not talking to all the right people and we're missing lists. So that was my point. Um, Wayne Harrison with ADQ. I just wanted to ask if there was um, some guidance on what attributes if we come up with that list of 10, what attributes would you guys like to see uh, and some guidance on that perhaps so we can harmonize that with all the stakeholders submitting lists? How about this? Everybody's going to come at it with a different set of attributes, right? Whatever they have in their database. For, for right. Each state will have sort of different characteristics and, and um, conditions that they want addressed. Um, uh, a mining company might, the tribes are going to have a different perspective. I think that would be richer than to put a parameter around it because then we're going to learn from that what, what is valuable to one group versus another. And, and then we'll land in the middle on some really great, on some really great options. Yeah, I, I know. Because we could, we could kill ourselves trying to figure out attributes, quite right. frankly. And it's, it's uh, because it's pretty personal based on, on you know where where you're coming from well when we were trying to find the four the four pilot sites ann and i sat down with the state of nevada folks and tried to figure out those attributes and after what an hour and a half we kind of had a list yeah. um but you know it wouldn't it's be tough. the same it wouldn't necessarily be the same list if somebody else was doing it so yeah. i don't know is there a way for us to collaborate on building all the attributes we should at least be considering well, or just let it be organic to begin with. And I think the attributes will fall, follow, fall out of that. Uh, one we other group that we may want to reach out to is the uh, National Park Service. Uh, I know that they have uh, engaged our AML Bureau to reclaim some of the sites in New Mexico, but I'm sure other sites are out there that they would just love to have somebody work with and, and clean them up. Yeah, they do have a robust list and prioritization. Um, it's, it's impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Any other thoughts, ideas, next steps? Oh, Jeff's got something for us. I don't want to throw a spanner in the works here, but I don't think I'm betraying trust, but I've talked to several people in the Department of Interior that they conducted a survey and asked various states about how they felt about abandoned mine workings. And as you saw in my maps, there's a lot of states in the country that don't have significant hard rock mineral deposits, but they do consider that they have things that need to be fixed. Right. So I don't know if you want to go after that group of people or not. And I don't know how that stacks up with legislation. But the stakeholders in those states resoundingly said to DOI that if there's a national inventory of abandoned mines, we don't want to be excluded from that. 
Is there anything in the current version of the rule that would, that might be a way to get some support from states that don't normally have a lot of hard rock mining. Their, their biggest interest, of course, was non-coal because coal is covered right. by SMACRA, right? So a lot of states felt they were being excluded from the ability to do work that they felt was important. And it might just be somebody falling off of a quarry wall, right? In those places where they don't have glacial gravels, right? But they felt they were being excluded if they didn't have the that that other funding. All right. Okay. And it, is that I'm just thinking that through if they didn't have active mining in those states, but maybe they did the historic processing. Is there is there like you know a facility to to clean up? Is is I I just I'm fishing here because I don't uh, trying to picture each of these states, but yep. Yep, something to think about. Thanks for that. Set in. Oh, the, sugar, the sugar crash is hitting us all. <laughs> oh, it's the end of the day anyway. So. Yeah. Thank you so much um, to have this level of engagement and everything that um, I've learned today. Every time we do one of these summits through M MMSA, there's just so much exchange and uh, really appreciate every all the panelists and, and what they the, the prov provocative thoughts and information that they shared with us. And, and then to all of you, the, the discussions that ensued will uh, uh, we'll make sure that we get um, all this on the website, it's probably gonna take at least uh, probably a week uh, for that to happen. But I encourage you to go to the MMSA website. There are pamphlets out on the, um, the greeting table. Um, see what, we've, what the compilation of material is there already and then continue to look for when we get this posted. And we'll also send out a sort of a next step uh, summary to the group uh, of all the, the high level things that, uh, that we'll keep progressing through the summit, the um, AML summit committee. And um, I keep looking over here to Jack McPartland who's leadership in MMSA um, so that we can continue these conversations and keep building on, on how, to, how to create more successes in the field. But thank you all so much. Jeff, do you have any closing? No, just, just thank you, uh, Ann and Jeff, for, uh, for a great summit. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Job well done. Thank you. Thank you very much.